Jeff, you ready? For what? What do we? We got a podcast to record. What? Yeah. What They're watching. That? What's up, YouTube? Oh, hi. <laughs> I thought we were just hanging out. I thought we were just going to get here with our Babylon 5 background and just hang out for a while. Yeah, we've literally been hanging out for like the last hour and a half. I know. <laughs> I almost feel like there should be the other show, right? Like this is the, so hi YouTube. This is the show about the show, right? Where we're making the podcast. We're doing the stuff. You get everything. We should do the other show. <laughs> that is the show before the show. Actually, we shouldn't. The show before the show about the show. Right. Yeah. That is, that is a, a horrible idea. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And I feel like it would get us in a lot more trouble than it's worth. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's that. Things are like, hey, I can say this in confidence right now, right? <laughs> Not that we say anything bad, Jeff. No. Like, God, but, I well, mean, it's literally, it's just you, me, and our FBI guy outside. That's right. Like, oh, it's, it's a, it's right. a private Face, conversation. Facebook because they're just watching everything. Exactly. You know, and probably yeah. Elon at this point. What's up, E? Uh, <laughs> We're nothing yeah. bad. Please right. don't, right. don't don't shut us down or kill us. Right. Uh, and send, I won't. Don't send your robots. People. Yeah, don't send your robots after us. Uh, so anyway, uh, we are here. Sorry, I got a mess. Uh, we are here to record our episode on uh, what is this episode? A day in the strife, a Babylon day Five, strife. season three, episode three. A day in the strife. Probably one of the more clever names, Jeff. It's fun. It's fun to season. say. It's fun. Yeah, it really wasn't fun. It wasn't a fun day, but it was a fun way to name the day. Oh yeah. Oh, for the day overall. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. I feel like not a lot of people enjoyed enjoyed that day. We had we have probably the biggest heartbreak of the entire season happened in this episode know, for me. I know. Maybe the whole show so far. I wanted I mean a little spoiler but like the outro to this oh I should have prepped this. The outro for this should be like the incredible Hulk. Bum 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 bum. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. When Bruce Banner would walk on to the next town. The right. That's uh oh shoot. Um What's his name? Uh, the, Lou Ferrigno? Yeah, that guy. It's yeah. Lou Ferrigno Hulk is what yeah. you're talking about, right? Yeah, I'm talking about the real, the real Hulk. Yeah, the, yeah. The, with the the Bruce Banner that looks like Bones McCoy. Yes. <laughs> and no, I, it might not have been Bruce. might have been some of the, I don't know, that Banner guy, but yeah, that piano walking music, some of the saddest music ever. And that should have ended this episode. Yes, yes. Well, we're here talking about the end of the episode. Let's talk about the start of the episode. Let's talk about what's going to happen in this episode. For those of you out there at YouTube, if you're just new joining us, welcome. You're awesome. Hey, while you're here, if you decide you like what we're doing, subscribe, like, all that sort of stuff, you know, that everybody out there on YouTube land asks you to do. We're continuing this train roll and subscribers are, are popping off, Jeff. And That's I'm loving awesome. seeing the numbers. You know, it, you got this community we've built here. Uh, the, uh, you and me, we just put it up. Y'all are the ones that built it. Uh, you rock. You absolutely rock. So make sure you comment down below. Jeff and I do our best to get back to you as, as much and as often as we can down there. Um, and you guys are watching us record a podcast, which means you get all the behind the scenes. This is how we do it. This is how we bake the souffle. Oh, this is how we churn the butter. Yes. This is how we, uh, how we get the milk. Jeff, do you know what the sign language word is for milk? I, I don't. I'm a little I nervous. I explained to this out. to my daughter the other day. Full disclosure, my grandparents are deaf. I grew up living with my grandparents and uh, speaking sign language, just like I spoke English growing up. This was all, this has always been my favorite sign. It's the sign for milk. Which is, yeah, it mimics the pulling right. of an udder, right? It's better this, than water, there it is. right? Th this is how the udder is pulled. <laughs> <laughs> that one might get us in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So anyway, you guys are going to get all of all of that stuff. Jeff's going to clean it up for the podcast and the audio feed. Frankly, you guys are getting the much better show, uh, but you may also get all the slip ups and the, the outtakes and everything that go along with that as well. So Jeff, with that, oh, please, spoiler free. Keep everything spoiler free. Comment down below. All that sort of stuff, Jeff. Hit Let's it. do it. Here we go. First time. You're new here, or someday, somewhere, I'll make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2022-2023. 
2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5, for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. We are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who are watching Babylon 5 for the first time and searching for what we call the Star Trek-like messages in this series. Contrary to popular belief, Jeff, we are not comparing this show to Star Trek. That is correct. But we are going to search for those messages and decide how much we really like the series. We are so much not comparing this show to Star Trek that we play a game just to stop us from doing exactly that. And that game is the rule of three. That means each one of us gets only three references to Star Trek during this episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, or refund. <laughs> hey, Brent. Yo. We have a five-star review. Oh, yes. This one is off of Apple Podcasts, and it's from, <laughs> this has got to be the greatest, greatest name of all time on Apple Podcasts, from Cap'n Stinky the Swamp Rat. <gasps> I read this one. This potato, before you even get there, I know which one you're talking about. This is, this one's been around for a long time. I've been waiting for you to get to this one, Jeff. This is perhaps my second favorite review we have ever received just because of the title of the review alone. For the record, the, the one that's the favorite is, do you remember that one? I don't remember how long ago it was. Somebody wrote like all the the references like throughout the entire uh, review. Like it was oh, that like was uh, Norm. That was Norman Lau who did that, right? Who had all oh, the- Oh, that was Norm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That was Norm's. Uh, that was such a clever- cleverly written review this one is right right there next to it captain stinky the swamp rat writes <laughs> it's just fun to a, say that that was uh oh gosh that was what was that long dark back in the last season for that was the one, uh, uh what was before that distant star. Distant star. Dis yeah distant star right, swamp yeah. Rat. i forgot all about that yeah it's it was his, his little friend that looked like a tellerite yeah i blocked like the first four or five six seven or eight episodes of season two out of my head rightly so yeah oh, anyway hey back to the good stuff yes captain sticky the swamp rat says epic nuggets to chuckle over this podcast has it all intergalactic discussion thoughts on alien hairstyles and a penalty buzzer i grew up watching babylon 5 and now i get to enjoy new perspectives as the hosts document their first time I also get to laugh when predictions for future episodes are far from accurate while muttering under my breath, just you wait. If you're looking for a Babylon five journey, this podcast is it. I love the two things he says there. He says, one, I get to laugh at them as they make their predictions, uh, which I, I mean, Jeff, I'm, I'm a comedian of old. Like I like when people laugh at me. Because I know that actually means they're laughing with me. Right. You know, uh, I'm in on the joke, folks. Like, I'm not because I don't know, but I am in on the joke. But the other thing is he said that uh, he's a, he's a, he gets new perspectives. And particularly for those of you guys out there that are longtime Babylon 5 viewers, uh, if Jeff and I can come in and provide a new perspective on something for you, that's a win in my book. It's pretty cool. I've got one more. Andrew reached out via our website, Babylon5first.com. That's the number five and the word first. Dot com with some questions. I'll share one of them. It was a lengthy email, but I want to share just a little bit of it. it says, hey guys, first, I want to thank you for putting this show together. It has quickly become one of my favorite pods. The work you put in really comes across, and it's been a blast following along, watching episodes once a week as intended. I appreciate your unvarnished opinions and your discipline in not watching ahead. It makes your show special. Question. Do you plan to cover the TNT movies? I ask this in part because my on-ramp to B5 was through In the Beginning, so I have a slightly different perspective on the show. 
While it does spoil a few things, overall, I feel in the beginning is a better introduction than The Gathering. I hope you guys do cover third space in the middle of season four and then watch in the beginning before starting season five. I'll be there watching along. Yeah, Jeff, uh, we have a list. Our good friend John over at the Trek Profiles podcast sent us a, hey, watch things in this order. And I was looking at that list not too long ago. And it has all of those movies at the end of the series. And we have just kind of said we're going to follow that order. Now, we could change that up because I've heard this in the beginning is is really good to watch between season four and season five. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a few others that get placed in various spots. Uh, so I, we haven't had that full discussion. That's not one we're going to have right now in this moment. But uh, I think I'm safe to say, yes, we will watch them and cover them. As far as when that happens right now, it's scheduled for at the end of the show and not during the middle, but stay tuned. Jeff and I might change that as we will. Yeah. I think we've had quite a few things offered for us, right? The movies, a couple books, uh, yeah. a few comic series as well. And I, I think that I can, I think it's safe, right. To say that we're wildly interested in all of them. We plan at a minimum watching the movies, uh, reading JMS's autobiography at a minimum, probably Claudia Christians as well maybe diving into more, but also we are at the very beginning of the third season out of five of a uh, 110 episode series. So uh, we'll figure it. We'll figure that out at some point. We got a ways to go, but it is coming quick though, Jeff. I know we are in the beginning of the third season. Like we're almost like, yeah, halfway. Like, Yeah. yeah. Well, Jeff, you know, what we like to do along with, uh, our reviews and our comments and our rule of three. What's that? Well, when we get to the end of the episode, we like to play this game where we try to guess what the next week's episode is going to be based on hearing the title alone. We've never seen a description. We haven't read the really bad description that's on HBO max. We haven't looked at the thumbnails. It's just, here's the title. What's the episode going to be about? That's usually where the people laugh at us about the predictions we make and say, just you wait. Usually, although I'm sure that happens during the, the red yarn sessions, that's the name of a good podcast, that the is. red yarn session, or, a, or a rock album title. It's the red yarn sessions. Those are both. There good. you go. We could anyway. Do both. Um, uh, we, we like to do that at the end of the episode where we have reached that part of this episode where we look back at what we said last week, a day in the strife was supposed to be about, and we pay the piper for just how right or wrong we were. So Jeff. Just how right or wrong were you with your prediction? I actually pulled up my notes to see exactly what I said because I feel like my first couple words really describe how close I was. Jakar is trying so hard. I tried so hard to get this right. And I got kind of close. Like I said, it was going to be about Jakar. There was some Jakar in there. I said he'd be trying to get the resistance to stand up and it would be, here's where I completely missed the boat. I thought it'd be a series of tragically comedic failures for Jakar. And I thought it'd be a step towards him uh, reaching rock bottom. And uh, that was not the case. Comedic would not be the word I would use to describe this episode. Tragic, um, especially in regards to a couple of people in this one, yeah. I think would might be a little more apropos. Yes. What, Jeff, what about you? I, I do believe you get more points this week than I do because you at least said Jakar. Jakar was even in this episode. <laughs> I said Marcus. Yeah. We didn't see a black hair one in this entire episode, all 43 minutes of it. I was I said it was going to be a day in the life of Marcus the Ranger. And no, no, not not at all. Not anywhere close. Uh, so Brent gets a big old fat dub on that one. Donut, uh, not dub donut, but Jeff, while I eat this donut over here, uh, why don't you tell folks out there who haven't seen this episode, or maybe it's been a while since they've watched it, or maybe just maybe they're listening to us ramble on about a show that they themselves have never seen. Tell us what happened in this episode, a day in the strife. The gears of bureaucracy grind in the 23rd century just like they do today. We are transported to most any city council meeting in the United States today. But this one happens to be Sheridan and Ivanova meeting with the TSA. I mean the TPA, Transport Pilots Association. See, Babylon 5 is ramping up weapons inspections, so they're either going to have to slow down getting through customs 
or need to increase docking fees to hire more inspectors. Sheridan does what most any facilitator has wanted to do in most any meeting ever, and that's to get up and call out a super loud and overly entitled dude out on his bluff. After that, they call for a recess. That's not the end of this story, I'm sure. You know, just like that other story about the upset dock workers that we had, you know, two years ago, and there's been so many follow-ups from. Well, an envoy from the Centauri show up, and it's two Narns. They're here to meet with Sheridan. Nafar, an obvious collaborator that just wants the Narn to be cool for a while, and Talon, his bodyguard. I feel like we might know Talon. Looks a little familiar. Well, they're here to shut down the armed Narn resistance on Homeworld, and that means picking up Citizen Jakar and sending him back. But Sheridan is not having it. There's no such thing as a boring day on Babylon 5. Let's see, what all's going on here? Londo has a meeting with Delenn where he tries to rekindle the friendship that Delenn is pretty sure they never actually had. There's a weird probe that shows up out of nowhere offering untold technologies if they can pass the SATs, and Dr. Franklin is the worst. Londo, Londo's tired of hanging around with a goody two-shoes, and he's trying to find Veer a new job. He convinces Delenn to let him go to Minbar to reopen the Centauri diplomatic mission. But Veer doesn't want to go. Londo paints it as a great career opportunity. So, head down, quiet and sad, Veer shuffles off on a transport. Hopefully, hopefully to be seen again someday. The B-5 crew are working on the SATs for this probe that's promised all kinds of great stuff, but the stakes here are a little bit higher than getting into an out-of-state college. If they don't answer right, the big old bomb inside the probe will explode and destroy the station. At literally the last minute, Sheridan figures out the probe isn't here. No, it's not here to test for intelligence so that these can uh, they can meet up with these new species. It's testing for intelligence that might be a threat. They use some bots to push it far away from the station. Then they transmit their Scantron sheet with all the answers and Sheridan was right. It blows up and it happened far enough away that everybody's gonna be okay. But the Narns, Nafar is playing hardball. He tells them, all the Narns on the station, that if Jakar doesn't return to Homeworld, the Centauri will harass their families back home. In another chapter of the hit series, Jakar, Servant Leader, he agrees to return despite his... his friend? Garibaldi begging him not to? Wow. Well, on his way to the ship, we see what happens when a leader is willing to sacrifice themselves for their people. They literally block him and tell him that he needs to stay and continue the fight. Talon, now I know where I remember this guy from. He's the dude from the uh, from the abduction ship with uh, Sheridan all alone in the night, right? So they drank a little bit of orange juice together. They reminisced. That's Talon. Cool. It's good to see dudes doing all right. Well, he pledges himself to Jakar and the Narn resistance, and he does so by ruining a perfectly fine pair of gloves with his Chris knife, what they call a katak, kind of a kind of a samurai sword. And then Franklin. You know, you know how Dr. Franklin is literally the worst? Well, not only that, turns out he's also hooked on stems. He's also a huge jerk, not only to the people that he works with, but his friends and his colleagues back home. At the end of this day, Londo's Jiminy Cricket has left. The Narns are unifying under Jakar. The probe crisis has been averted, and Franklin is one step closer to, hopefully, being fired. Ah. <sighs> All in a day's work. Oh, not quite. We forgot about the Transport Association. Poor Ivanova and Sheridan end up right back where they started. Brent, what did you think of this one? A day in the strife. So, help me out with this episode. You texted me earlier today. I said... Hey, Jeff, good luck with the Star Trek messages in this episode. And you're like, yeah, we could spend an hour talking about that alone. Uh -huh. Okay. So was this an episode about gun control 
in the Second Amendment? Or was this an episode about drug use? Was this an episode about um, not meddling in the internal affairs of alien cultures or cultures that are not your own? Uh, was this a, an episode about not being burned out? Was this an episode about looking out for others? Was this an episode about being a, a conscience for those around you? Uh, was this an episode uh, about uh, not dying? Was it... Well, this episode was everything everything like smushed into one <laughs> like the only the only thing this one didn't have was two guys with like half their face paint in one color half their face paint in the other and then the other guy is the exact same thing it's just reversed and they're at war like it's on the right the only side thing this one was missing yeah right i believe i get a buzz for that one. Oh, that's right yeah there you go um I was just so on board with the narrative. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. This is totally what this. Oh. Literally, literally, I, my first note on this was, is this episode about gun control in the Second Amendment? Because we've totally seen JMS make little veiled political commentaries like this before. A la green and purple or red and blue. Take your pick. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, whatever. Um, but I, you know. Here's the thing. This was not a fun episode. I don't think we can say it was a fun episode. This was a good episode. This was a fine episode. Like, did this one knock my socks off? No. Did I have fun with it? No. Was I blown away by everything that happened? No. Actually, some of it was predictable. The whole thing, I don't know about you, Jeff. The whole thing with the ship at the end where he's like, nope, actually, they're just trying to fake us out and see whatever. I Like, I called. As soon as it popped up, I was like, oh, I know exactly what's going on with that ship. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. it wasn't. That was not a shock to me at all. Uh, I did go back and rewatch this one a second time before we recorded. And, like, there was a point earlier where they said something in the episode where it's like, yeah, Sheridan's known for being this great strategic. Stratistician, strategist, strategist, that thing right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, they're obviously just going to put that in for this episode. Although he apparently is that, um, this was a little bit of a heartbreaker episode though, because you've got the whole thing going on with Jakar who you're like, no, this is not a good idea. And this man's about to go sacrifice himself for the good of his folks. Oh my yeah. gosh. The needs of the one outweighing the needs of the few, or I'm sorry, flip that around. The needs of the many outweighing the needs of the one like oh my gosh like all of those messages are just all over but then veer leaves yeah i did that one is probably the part that caught me the most by surprise i did not think he would actually leave and i have so many thoughts about veer leaving and how it's such a bad idea and londo took a whole other step in his evilness for me in this yeah. particular episode like he's digging himself in his heels and to lose Veer in the middle of that is, is just something else. So yeah, I liked this episode, but I'm not really sure why Jeff, what, what did you think of this one? I like this one a lot too, but I think I liked it really because like what I, you know, I started the recap with the transport association and ended it with the transport association. And yeah. to me, like, I think I, I'm going to guess the point of this episode was to you know, move some plot stuff along, of course, but really to show you a day in the life. This is what it's like to live and work on Babylon 5. And I really appreciated it in my job, in my day job. A lot of times this is what happens where I've got this just ridiculous level of bureaucratic sit around and blah, 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 and like your PowerPoint slide deck and this, blah, blah, blah. and that like kind of is the wrapper of my day. And it's what people think I do all mm -hmm. the time, you know, and that's when, oh, you command a international space station or intergalactic space station of, of diplomacy. Oh, you must be in meetings all day. So yeah, that's the thing you think, but actually you're solving this problem. You have a crisis over here. You've got somebody with a personal thing. Like to me, it was a really good, just slice of life kind of episode. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think what made it not fun, right? I also watched this one two times. I had a hard time watching it the second time in some parts because it's like, okay, it's a great day in the life. Life here sucks. <laughs> like mm. not a lot of good going on for anybody. 
in, right. in this whole thing. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I enjoyed it. That's not the right word. Yeah. I, I thought it was good. It's a great episode. It's a, it, it, it's important. It's all those things, but I think it just drives home that like things aren't good on Babylon five at all. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of those, like, if we were to take the entire season of th- season three, and we understand that this is supposed to be a chapter, like this is supposed to be a story, right? If we were to take this whole thing and, and somebody looks at us and goes, guys, you have a four hour movie. I need you to cut it down to like two, two and a half hours max. Mm-hmm. This would be something that gets cut out and left on the, on the cutting room floor. Yeah. You know what I mean? But this would absolutely be the thing you put on the DVD for like, Oh, we hated to lose this one because mm-hmm. we liked it so much. It just, I don't know in the long run that how much this one's going to matter. I think two you things know? out of this one matter. There's the Narn stuff with Jakar um, unifying really the resistance under him. Like there, there's not like, up to this point, there's been some questions, right? Are you the guy? Like, are you this, you blah, blah. Like now he's totally the guy. And then I think Franklin's stem thing is gonna, mm-hmm. you know, I was actually thinking about that when they ran the stem story with him. I, I feel like, I feel like I thought that was going to be Ivanova that she mm. was good. Cause they've talked a couple times about how she doesn't sleep well in certain situations. And you know, the, the, that incredible scene back in season one with Sinclair and Garibaldi and Ivanova and, and them just, you know, talking quietly about the time with the Jesuits and we'd meditate, put her to sleep. It was great. I'm like, Oh, she's going to get hooked on stems. I wouldn't have thought Franklin, but also of course it's Franklin. Right. And that's, that's going to turn the quality of mercy back in season one. Again, like that's the reason that lady lost her license was stems. So they planted Mm -hmm. a seed, you know, two years ago that I think is going to sprout in Franklin this season. It's just going to be a bigger way. Do do you mean that Franklin could lose his job? Like that's real. That would be lovely. What do they call the great, uh, the great maker is what Londo calls it. Let me, uh, yeah, right. if that's whatever, whatever gods I worship, according to the, to the land, right between me and whatever gods I worship. Yeah. Please fire, please fire. Dr. Frank. That would be just fantastic. Man. You want to talk about Franklin real quick? No, that whole thing. Well, I, I no. just want to get it out of the way. No, 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 no. Before we do that, I want to talk about two other guys real quick. Oh, okay. I want to talk about, um, Steven mocked. Stephen mocked played Nafar in this episode. Okay. He looked familiar to me. I don't know if you know who Stephen mocked is. I don't. He's one of those faces. I think you would probably recognize if you were to, to go see who see him peel see off all face. the prosthetics. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, he usually plays like a cop in whatever show he's in. Usually kind of like the cop who's like, he's not in uniform. Like he's the detective. Okay. But he's got the trench coat on and he's smoking a cigarette and he's got like a half drink cup of coffee in his hand. Okay. He's that guy, you know, but where I really know him from is the amazing movie. Jeff, he is the father of this movie, uh, not of the movie. He's in the movie, the monster squad. Did you ever see the monster squad? I don't think I don't this think is I like, have. this is like a B rated horror flick from the 1980s um kind of like a goonies wannabe doing monsters okay okay kind of a deal the best line that ever came out of this this episode this movie was wolfman's got nards <laughs> i've heard right? the line i've heard the yes, line. yeah it comes okay. from this film here um so uh, such a good movie oh 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 i'm not gonna i'm not gonna waste a star trek reference on it anyway um a guy who played in one of them other shows was also in this movie. Anyway, okay. this guy was the dad. And whenever I see his face, I'm just like, Wolfman's got nards. It's that dude. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, he's the cop. But cool. you you mentioned uh, the guy playing uh, Talon mm-hmm. as the guy who interacted with, um, who was it, Sinclair or whatever? Sheridan. He was Sheridan, Sheridan on the Stribe ship. Yeah. Do you know who else he was? Mm-mm. Yeah, we've seen him before, too. We've actually seen him out of makeup and then in makeup and then stuff. He was Nelson Drake in the phenomenal, remarkable season one episode infection. 
turned into the he's the guy no he's the everything. dude yeah no that's yeah this is really him. yeah this is really him. yeah 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 i when you when you started talking about oh we've seen him before that's where i thought you were going and then you didn't and i was like oh i've got to i've got to point that out okay wow, now we can talk. i have no yeah. idea yeah i'm gonna leave that one i'll let you look that up but uh yeah let's talk about franklin and being too chicken to go talk to the girl until he goes and shoots up in the bathroom seriously and you know he's like no it's not a problem i don't have a problem i can stop anytime i want uh, it the the note i have this is the note i have out of when garibaldi had him over to his to his quarters made him yeah. pasta bread a salad i mean garibaldi went full olive garden for franklin like it was, well this is this is the opposite of whatever that other thing was that we saw franklin coming over to eat at garibaldi's house the remember remember when franklin put him yeah franklin put him on like the diet yeah it was the banya cool the yeah the whatever anchovy, that was. anchovy stuff Just, the, ugh, the crushed anchovies somebody yeah. sent us the, the recipe for that and i was with it until it said crushed like smush like mortar and pestle yeah. anyway uh this is like the opposite of that meal yeah it looked great this is yeah. awesome and and franklin was terrible but he was also totally on point for an addict like everything he said and did. And Garibaldi was totally on point for an addict talking to like the note I wrote was this is great writing of a terrible person. And, and frankly, I think too some great acting of a terrible person. I think yeah. that, uh, Biggs who plays him, Richard, Richard Biggs, I think it's fantastic. It's great, but I, like, you know, I'm sorry. I thank you for bringing that up because for as much flack as we give Franklin, the character, uh, Biggs, the actor, is portraying him uh, really well, except for that time he got creepy with that chick that just came out of cryo. Yeah. Um, although he might have even played that really well. Like he was just given what the director told him to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, he, that conversation I feel like I've been a part of before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Like um, you, you can't have that conversation the way Garibaldi had it with Franklin unless you have your own junk that you've dealt with, you know, and to have them turn around and be like, well, look at you. You've never met a body. You didn't like, which totally low blow. Yeah. And he, and called, he even he called, called himself. Him. Yeah. yeah. He called himself out. Which Oregon, that actually and, is something I never or very rarely hear when somebody goes that route. They're not like, Oh dude, I'm sorry. That was a low right. Blow. But I think it's, I think it's cause they really are buddies, you know, like they're friends yeah. and Franklin's not so far, far involved in his disease yet that he's, he's going to, uh, sacrifice friends yet. Right. Uh, I think we'll get there, but it, what it really reminded me of though, is in Oregon, we have a program and a few other States across the country, actually more and more have this, but we have a peer support, uh, program that's, that's regulated by, by the government and it's billable to Medicaid and it's insurance can bill for it and whatever. But like, instead of just going to get addiction recovery services from some doctor or some professional with a whole bunch of master's degrees, you can get recovery services from a peer, from someone who is, does have addiction and is living in recovery. And it is wildly effective. It is really so effective because it's, Go I figure. can sit down, right? Like with a group of, I, I always use this example where I can sit down with a group of at risk youth, you know, youth that are at risk for joining gangs or things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm a big dude. I'm all tatted up. I mean, yeah, they're pretty nerdy, but like I got a lot of ink all up and down. Like I can look there and be like, look, kid, you don't want to do it. It's bad. Okay. Don't do it. After they beat me up and rob me, they're going to leave and go immediately join a gang. I will be totally ineffective regardless of what letters I have after my name. But mm -hmm. if I was in a gang, and I did hard time and I did bad things. And I turned my life around and I talked to those kids. They're going to listen to me. It's the same thing with, an, with someone who, 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 it's the same thing with an addict where if I sit down with, oh, I have all these degrees and I understand your, uh, you know, the diagnosis and the principal of this and what, yeah, well, I'm gonna, but if I'm like, dude, when I was living on the streets and I was having to do these things to get from one fix to the other and this to eat, this is how I, oh man, thank you for that. Like I'm going to. Yeah. so wildly effective this was that and if franklin doesn't fall off the edge the legend is it's gonna be because of garibaldi did you notice when franklin was being his peak terrible self mm -hmm. and yelling at that poor doctor back on earth just trying to like get dude on vacation to answer a molecular biology question right 
but like he's yelling and like all the staff are turning and looking at him. There's a patient lying on the gurney. Like he's, uh, he even like stops, uh, turns and he even looks at Franklin. No, he he's didn't. just like, dude, what is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, speaking about Biggs acting the way that somebody would, would act. Okay. Not only is he acting the way that an addict would, I know that doctor. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. I take that back. I know those doctors. Cause it's a common thing to be overworked, overstressed, understaffed with the support people you have mm -hmm. to be tasked with doing stuff that is not actually your job. You know, do you know, do you know what, do you know what doctors get paid for? You know what their number one job is as a doctor? Hmm. It's not to see you as a patient. It's not to operate on you. No, no. It's to write the note. Okay. And then when the insurance company asks you for more information for you to spend time talking to them and on hold while you're waiting to talk to them and scheduling peer to peer reviews. And that's really what doctors get paid for. Not actually doctoring, doing the paperwork so that the people that control the money will actually, uh, wow. you know, pay them yeah. for their work. But that burnout, I mean, it's so typical in the medical field, uh, but especially among physicians and for physicians, you know, I, I know people look at them like, well, yeah, but look how much they're paid and da, da, da. It, yes, all of that's true. The other thing about those physicians, remember, they sacrifice most of them. If they just went straight through school, sacrifice their entire 20s mm -hmm. to be able to do this. And the decisions that they make on a day in, day out basis are life and death. That's a lot of stress and a lot of weight to carry on your, yeah. on your shoulders. And here's uh, Sheridan up in CNC being like, dude, if you don't give me these answers, we're all going to blow up. And he's like, okay, I'm sorry. The fate of the entire station is on my shoulders to make this happen. And I just want a nap. Right. Yeah. Like I, I get it. I've, I've seen it. <laughs> I live with it. I know like, Oh, I've been there in many cases. Like I re um, I remember, uh, I'm going to age myself here, but I mean, many, yeah. many of our listeners and viewers are here as well. Uh, I remember my first colonoscopy that I got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was talking to the doctor before, before I went under for, for that really fun experience. And I asked him, I was like, dude, like there are a lot of parts to the body, a lot of specialties you could pick. Why? Why, this, why this, why this one? Yeah, yeah. I, and his answer blew me away and it makes sense. And I think especially given your social circles, it really resonates too. He's like, oh, uh, I'm never on call. I work office hours. I come in, I do this, I write the notes, I send it off. That's I'm not on call. Cause not only I, from my you know understanding, do they sacrifice their twenties for the education, but then they sacrifice their thirties and forties and fifties and their social lives and their family lives and whatever, unless they have a great partner who can work to balance all those things because like, oh yeah. Yeah. So I worked uh, 62 hours uh, this week in three days. Yeah. Like that's the job. You know, yep. and yep. hopefully, hopefully you got some time off after that, but you might not have. And if you did mm -hmm. sleep at all, it was on a little cot in a closet down the hallway from the supply room. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's wild, man. And even when you do have the day off, you still have meetings and people calling you, asking you about stuff that happened while you were doing uh, Anyway, It's, it's a whole thing, man. And, and I like, I get it. Um, I'm not saying that him being on drugs and turning all into house MD was the thing to do, you know, um, the only thing he could have done is just, you know, get in there and in a moment, just be like, but I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. That would have, that's the only thing that would have made this better to me. More Ladies realistic gentlemen. anyway. For your daytime Emmy consideration, Jesse Spano. <laughs> portrayed by Jeff, I have, I have now saying in two weeks in a row on this show that you need to stop me. No, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is good stuff. Um, what What's going to happen? We didn't really resolve the whole situation with Franklin. Oh, no, no. Like, he, like, we ended it with him like, yeah, I didn't use any stems. And we're like, we saw you. Yeah. You were massaging it, really? it into your hand. Saw the whole thing. Yeah. 
yeah, I need I need this to come back. Like this needs to not be dropped, you know. Um, I and, and like for the for the sake of the show, like you don't do something like this and then just let it go away. Yeah, you know, I'm I think it's going to come back. I think it's going to be big, and I think it's going to be pretty devastating when it does. Like this, mm. he, he's he's gonna he's gonna drop something big, and it's going to be very costly. Do you want to talk through the probe stuff really quick? <laughs> sure. There's not a ton there. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, so here's literally all I have. Well, mm. I have two things, actually. One, uh, yep. Sheridan Sheridan said, boom. That's that's cool. That's that's neat because, you know, Savanova and then Sheridan said it. Um, so literally all I have is where'd this thing come from, who sent it, and does it matter at all in the scope of everything? So here's, here's my thought on that because this is my only note about the whole probe thing, too. Uh, well, no, my, my two notes, uh, I'm sorry. I had three. Wow. Okay. I had three notes. My first note was this thing's a joke, right? <laughs> like, this is just a joke. Like it's, it's not going to blast you with 500,000 megatons. If you miss an answer, that is ridiculous. Also, I was like, I don't understand what they're doing here. And then I went, Oh, I get it. It makes no sense right now but I think this is going to turn out to be like season three's geometry of shadows. Really? And if you remember, if you remember that episode in season two, we watched that one and we're like this, this episode just makes no sense. What it, what was the point of this episode? And oh, people were, we mad. got blasted. Yeah. They were furious with us. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, well you had that conversation there. Okay. Spoiler for you guys are keeping up with us. We're at this point in the timeline. They're like, well, but that conversation between the techno mage and Londo, where he's like, you got billions of people's blood on your hands. And they told you that he was going to turn bad. And I'm like, I didn't know that back then. Yeah, we've known that for I like a month. have possibly seen that, right? Yeah. Like now looking back at it by the end of season two, rewatching it. Guess what? Oh, I now understand what he's talking about. You know yeah. what I mean? What was that? What was the episode? Well, we talked about the, with the cryo freeze lady, long, dark, long, dark. And that was an episode where we're like, Hey, remember that little like ghost thing that it let out that it was. And we're like, Hey, it wasn't until the end of the season, but we're like, was that a shadow that was hitching a ride home? Cause that makes more sense now mm -hmm. to know what it is, you know? Yeah. Like, that was still a terrible episode, but it made more sense at the end of the second season, right? 20 episodes later. I think this probe is going to turn out to be like that. I think really? we may come back. Like we're going to understand this probe a lot later down the line. Like we're going to look at it now and be like, what the heck was that? And then we're going to see what it was, but it's just going to be a lot later. Hmm, okay. That's my guess. I could be wrong. Somebody out there is laughing at me going, <laughs> just you wait right now. And that's okay. I, yeah. I, I'm glad for you guys too. Yeah. My guess is we'll never see it. Hiding her hair won't even be mentioned again. I, it won't, it won't bother me if we don't. I'm just making a guess that we will. Yeah. So, um, although I will say out of that whole situation, we got some amazing banter between Sheridan and Ivanova. We did. And I wish <laughs> I would have written it down, but I didn't. I just, uh, there was just some great lines. That they were popping off one after each other. I just loved when I forget what he said to her, but, uh, something like, uh, well, if I, if I wasn't all happy or whatever, I'd turn out like you. And she's all, do you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah. And, and dude, who's getting more and more lines, he's just like, right. I want to keep getting more and more lines. So no, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> That's right. You didn't. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's somebody's automatic shower yeah. settings are about to get a little cold. Yeah. That was it right there. That was, that was I'm going to turn your automatic shower settings to ice cold. And I'm like, wow, you have automatic shower settings. Okay. Well, it made me wonder too. Cause like, so she's like, I'm going to change your automatic shower settings. And I'm, and then Garibaldi, when he was talking to Franklin, he's like, or to Ivanova after Franklin was like, yeah, I read through Sheridan's personnel. You read through his personnel file. You can't do that. Yeah. I got to know things. Did you read through mine? Oh, I'd never do that. Whoa. <laughs> People have access to a lot of stuff on Babylon five. Hey, bank so accounts, sure personnel files. Oh, but see, here's the thing. Garibaldi should have access to a personnel file unless he really shouldn't be reading it. Mm -hmm. Then maybe he shouldn't have access to it. Or he has but access to everything but a redacted section or whatever. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, there's no way that anybody should have access to somebody else's bank account information, though. <laughs> but they just, right? Yeah, they get, uh, you know, t quality and mercy lady 
thing. They yeah. get uh, the one security guy way back who was you know d- doing bets and stuff. They got his stuff. Like it's all just out there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. We either got to talk about Londo and Veer, or we got to talk about Jakar and his whole situation. You pick, Jeff. I'll let you take it. Let's talk about um, let's talk about Londo because I'd rather end on a happier note than what we're going to end on here. With oh, Londo and Veer. Londo and Veer. Okay. Um, I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again just to double down because we got to start there. Uh, Londo took about ten steps into villainy in this episode alone. Uh, what he did with who what was that Nafar? Yeah. Whoa. What he did with Nafar when he came in, like I've really come to dislike Londo. I, I'm not yet ready to say I hate him, but I very much dislike him. This might be the first time though, Jeff, in it, for all the things he's done, this might be the first time I've wanted to full on punch him in the face. Yeah. He was terrible. I, I captured two quotes from there. The one was when he's talking to Nafar about, uh, in, in the way he starts it too. Do you think it would be safe for someone like me to walk down the streets of, of home world? I'd like to visit. I'd like to visit. And N- Nafar was great. He's just like the mostly empty streets would be fine. You know, but then the ones I capture where he says, um, he asks if the executions are still yeah, happening. Uh, yeah. And Nafar is like, yeah. And he's like, ah, progress, progress. He said it right to his face. You know, here's the thing. How many Narns exist? There can't be many. Because you're feeling 500 at a clip. You know, now, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we, we had a horrible, terrible point in our human history. That was absolutely real. Let me just make that 100% clear called the Holocaust where over 6 million people, human beings were murdered in a very short span. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe it's not that far fetched to think 500 at a clip, but like that just can't be good. You're just going to kill. You're going to pick 500 and just randomly kill them and execute them because somebody did something over here like that is the uh, frankly that's the stuff that leads to revolts and revolution oh yeah like that does not stabilize a a i think and his his whole reasoning behind it like when you get to his reasoning no you must you must crush them and various questions like what could we we've done to him isn't that enough no you must break them i don't want people in a hundred years to have to do what we've done again you know, like, yeah. like Londo, dude, yeah. that is not okay. Yeah. Veer's like, what do they even have? He's like, they still have their pride. As long as it remains, they will be a threat. A threat. They're starving. They're yeah. hiding. Oh my yeah. gosh. And that was the moment when Veer questioned him. That was the moment when Londo's like, you're gone. You're done. Yeah. Because I think. I think that the interactions he had with the land showed there's still this sliver of him. That's like, um, maybe I'm still a good guy. Maybe I'm still the fun guy at the party and it's all mm-hmm. good. And the just like, Nope. But I think that what it does, I think it's a combination of him kind of reaching out for a life preserver. Like if Delenn had said like, you know what, Londo, I do miss our talks. Why don't you come in? Let's have some Minbari tea. And let's, let's chat for a while. Like that could have turned things around, but she had no reason to, they never talked. They were never really friends. Like she was right. So what he's doing now, I think I brought this up before he's trying to set himself up as a victim so that he feels justified. Well, what other choice did I have? You wouldn't even talk to me. You know, Jakar, you, I came to you with this and you didn't share it. And I came to you with this and you didn't that. What, what did you expect me to do? I had to go and be responsible for the death of millions of Narns. See, I, I get a different read on that. While I think you're a hundred percent right. And that that is something he can pull from it. I don't, I'm not, I don't know that I'm ready to sit back and say that that's why he's doing things the way he's doing. Yeah. I think he might milk it the way that you're talking about, mm-hmm. but I don't know that that's why, like to, the way I read the whole thing. And, and to be clear, what we're talking about is he goes to the Lynn to get her to reopen the embassy so he can effectively 
shoo Veer away because Veer was acting like his conscience. Yeah. Veer is Londo's conscience and his conscience is poking at him. And we've seen Veer. We've talked about Veer getting stronger, getting more uh, forceful, becoming a, a bigger uh, voice as he should be to a guy that we're, we're, we're rooting for Veer. Yeah. Right. Totally. And, and Londo's sitting there and he's like, you know, despite my best efforts, I've actually really come to like this guy and I need him out of here because he's being a conscience and I can't keep doing what I need to do. But he also says, he's like, I don't want to keep exposing him to everything that must be done. He's like, and I really read that as like a, because I care about him, like yeah. Londo truly cares about him. And he almost doesn't want to have him corrupted. Yeah. Because he knows how pure and how good Veer is. But also I need you off my back because I can't do what I got to do if I got to look you in the face. It's like when he says to Delenn, it's okay. He wouldn't spy on you. He would consider it rude. You yeah. know, it's like he's highlighting his virtue in right. that. And he's just scoffing at him at the same time because mm -hmm, that's just yeah. ridiculous. But actually, that's kind of cool. It's kind of true. And and but yeah. what I kind of took out of that too is how there you know in 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 the self development world, there's the concept that you are the the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Sure. You know, and so if you're hanging out with a bunch of you know losers or whatever, you're probably going to be a loser. Hanging out with a bunch of high achievers, you're probably going to be a high achiever. And I took this to be that when you surround yourself with good people, it's that much harder to be bad. Yeah. And Londo knows he has to be bad. And so he's mm -hmm. trying to slough off the good people. So he doesn't have that conscience asking yeah. him those questions. No, I like, yeah. 100% agree. I think that's, that's why he's sending him away for his own personal reasons. But there's also the, well, why isn't he just sending him back home to the home world then? Yeah. If he just, if he's just, if he's trying to get rid of Veer, that's an easy, Hey, I'm just going to get rid of you. He's doing it the way he's doing it because he actually has come to care about Veer. He's trying you to know? find a good and, place for him to land. And, and yeah. And he's like, this will be a good career path move for you. And Veer is like, yeah, but I don't want to go. And he's like, too bad. Pack your bags, buddy. You got to go. And we see him just you, like, he leaves at the end. And I like the whole time I'm sitting there, like well, at any moment, Londo is going to be like, fear. No, come back. He, had a look. he didn't. Oh, they did. They gave us the look. And I'm like, Oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. And then he turns on and walks through the door and David freaking Netter's name comes up on the screen. I'm like, well, crap. Right under the welcome to Babylon five sign. Like yeah. that was, that was some placement i i think what bothered I mean outside of just the obvious of what's to, there to be bothered about this just a couple of episodes ago they were gonna they wanted to send veer back to the the, the home world and they were gonna yeah. get rid you know because londo needs a better a better aid and londo mm -hmm. put himself out there you know and yeah. i'm gonna keep you here and it even invited veer's family out yeah well that was to screw with veer but yeah, yeah. But, but it's just like, where, where, like, I don't know. It's, I have a theory. Okay. I have a theory. I, oh, and this isn't a theory. This is a prediction. All right. Okay. You and I have, have discussed in previous episodes how Veer, we think Veer is going to continue to become more and more and more important over the course of the show. If Londo eventually has to graduate and become the emperor, like we, we think he's probably going to Babylon five is going to need a new ambassador. Right. And I think, I think what this, this is the show, uh, promoting Veer or, or getting him in that, like starting him down that path mm -hmm. to be the next, uh, the next ambassador or whatever. He's going to be back on the homeward. Like this is getting Veer more into politics now and getting him, uh, not just as the, as the simple assistant. And, you know, it may even be like something happens on Minbar where he has to come back to Babylon five and he comes back to being Londo's assistant and then Londo's going to go and, and then he elevates and becomes the guy, you yeah. know, cause but ostensibly to, the assistant is going to be the next ambassador, right? Yeah. But he's got to go get that, um, diplomacy kind of entry on his, on his yeah. resume sort of a thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So th that's what I think they're probably doing. And you know, Stephen first is one of those guys who's not in every episode uh, out of the season. 
you know, he's, he's probably in, he's probably got a 13 episode contract. Yeah. Right. So this works well. So, right. Yeah. This is a good way to write, Hey, this is where he's doing. He, because Londo said, you're going to report to me. Mm -hmm. So Veer comes back to the station, probably not infrequently. And, uh, here we go. Just a different relationship and not here right. to question all of his and murder decisions. Can you imagine Veer coming back like wearing the garb of the Mimbar? Like, cause you know, you, you go to other countries, you adopt their clothing and you know, Veer's just eating it up. Like, Hey, look at me. I'm wearing whatever. And Londo's like, what are you wearing? <laughs> I wonder if, uh, you know, he, he's in an important diplomatic position as a, right. uh, as a centauri, he's going to need a telepath with him. Uh, what about that little, that, that teenage kid that the human teenage kid they sent to oh, Minbar, yeah. bring oh. her back and be Veer's a uh, telepath. But Sheridan Sheridan's there. Sheridan or not Sheridan Sinclair. Yeah. So they got Sinclair a body. And Veer knew each other. I mean, <gasps> somewhat like this is where Veer hooks up with the Rangers. And yeah. then whatever is that, and I still deeply believe he's going to be a key part in the Narn resistance, but he's able to, yeah, yeah. now he's got a direct line to Sinclair. Oh, that's good. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, but, but I, I totally ex anticipate seeing Veer, um, adopt a lot of Mimbari. Like he's going to be the true ambassador. He's going to celebrate their customs. He's going to, yeah. he's going to dive. He's going to learn their language and it's just going to piss the Centauri off because they think that everybody should be like them, you know, uh, you know, cause yeah, the Centauri want to fly their union Jack all over the universe. Right. So. Exactly. No offense to, no offense to our, our English brethren to history. Is all yeah, no offense. It's just a, it's just a fact that the most celebrated holiday in the world is independence from them. But I mean, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Narns. Yeah. So citizen Jakar, they say that with great disdain, every, like the word citizen never rolls off. It's always no. citizen Jakar. It's got some stank on that. It does. Absolutely. It does. Um, but he comes in. Oh, okay. I want to talk about, the guy Nafar, right? So he comes in and he's like, I'm here to replace citizen Jakar. He can't be here talking to people. And my first, my first question here is, is this guy a collaborator? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Cause we hate collaborators. If there's anything we learned from Karen or Reese collaborators suck. Exactly. And also Jakar is not going anywhere cause he's under sanctuary. Right. Like you yeah, can't love, force love Sheridan's response. It's like, this isn't my problem. Like go do right. your thing. I'm we're good. Right. But then Nafar goes and has the conversation with Jakar. And I, what, I don't remember if the other Narns were there or not, but he's like, okay, dude, I know what's going on. And I know that all this stuff is happening, but you don't know how bad it's getting. You're here in this cushy station. You've got your corner desk. You're eating your meals. Do you know what it's like for us back on the home world? And you're causing that. He's like, and, and there's a piece of him. He's like, look, yes, I don't want the Centauri there, but we're going to lie low. We're, we're going to, we're going to get everybody stable first. And, and once we can get that situated, then we can climb back out of this. But for right now, you got to go pops. You know, and I was like, maybe he's not a collaborator. Maybe he is, but he's not. Like, and I don't know how to feel about Nafar, Jeff. How did you feel about Nafar? I think, I think, I think that he is a collaborator, but I also think he's a collaborator. I'm going to ride your reference and I'm going to say in the vein of Odo, where he's not collaborating to hurt people and to, you know, trap people and, and, and set things up. He's collaborating to try to make things cooler. For the people that are around he he feels fully justified and feels like he's doing the right thing and that this is the path to narn freedom like he he fully yeah. believes that despite here you know, 200 and 300 almost 300 years before that time we can look at that and say no there's all this history that tells you it never works <laughs> it never works right. that way to do it but he thinks that it is and i think it's tough because without diving into all the way into like into the, into a star Trek conversation about it, it is literally a needs of the many and the needs of the few conversation. 
but they're looking at different menus, right? Mm -hmm. Jakar is looking at all like, yeah, it sucks for you guys on Homeworld, but there are Narns all across the galaxy going mm -hmm. through this. And if it's got to suck for you for a while, well, that's what's got to happen where Nafar only sees the many as the Narns on Homeworld. Hey, this sucks for us a whole lot. You need to stop. And so it just adds a layer to that needs of the many needs of the few equation where the definitions there matter a lot. Well, but then you have, you have those questions of, um, I, I mean, I, I love the answer that was it Talon gives at the end. Uh, I, I don't think it was Nafar uh, who says, uh, or maybe it wasn't Nafar. He goes, no, no, no. Our, our freedom is greater than our safety. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, frankly, I I don't know that that's a Star Trek message. That's an American message. That's just a human. That's, I think it's a that's human. A human. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, is it? I don't know. A lot of people might not agree with that, but I, that certainly is more real world political. Like your freedom means more than your safety. And yeah, this this may be what it costs to get us there, but overall, that's the better thing. Yeah, and and what I think of here is yeah, you're you're trading the good. For the great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to give up the yeah. good so I can have the great. And it's going to suck to get rid of the good because it really sucks to not have that. Um, Especially when the good is basic subsistence. Uh, right. Basic survival. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And not watching my friends and family and my loved ones and my little daughter go off to concentration camps yeah. or labor camps or whatever they said. Well, they use and, different words, but we know what they're yeah, talking about. Right. Exactly. Uh, that is just horrendous and horrible and, and, uh, you know, not okay. It's just, you know, and I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know uh, truly how things like that can still exist on earth today. I, I know, you it's know, a, and it I, is mind blowing. Jeff, I'm, I'm always, I'm always trepidatious about invoking certain names cause I don't want to catch uh, certain things, but you know, uh, we, we have from, from America, we have a, uh, female basketball star who is, uh, at least for a while. Um, I'm not sure if she's still there. I haven't followed up on it, but has been sent off to a labor camp for nine years for something that actually really didn't have much to do with her. And we all see it. Like mm -hmm. we all, this is, she, this is a puppet move. This has nothing to do with what she did. I know international incidents. I know things happen. How we haven't sent some SEAL 6 team in there to extract her at this point. You know, if we have, maybe we did. I don't know. Uh, maybe I missed the right. news conference. But uh, how that hasn't happened, I don't, like, I don't understand. Like, th those things shouldn't even be allowed to exist on this planet. Like, yeah. that's not speaking unilaterally as a country. That's the United Nations. Guys, this is what you exist for. That should not be allowed to exist. And if it does, you have an army that combines everybody together. Go bust it up. Go Don't do allow something. it to work. Mm -hmm. Like, no, it's not okay. Anyway, sorry. That's Brent's own personal feelings. If bad stuff happens to me, you guys now know why. Um, or my family. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Or I'll me, your friends, or anybody. Yes, yes, yeah, Jeff. You put a little line. I'm sorry. It's okay. Cause you said the things that needed to be said, you know, and I think it is, it's mind blowing that it still happens today. There are things mm -hmm. that are that, um, that micro and then things that are so much more macro that happen all the time that it's just like, how, how this far into the 21st century are these things happening? But now with Babylon five, we ask how this far into the 23rd century yeah. intergalactically are these things yeah. is the exact same things happening. Right. I thought it was great how Jakar kind of brought the Narns together early on and, and really just, he saw it, how the Centauri, they don't, like, they want the Narns gone. You know, that was crystal clear way back in Signs and Portents when Morden asked Londo what he wanted. He said he wanted every Narn dead, gone, finished. He made that pretty darn clear in this episode too. But they don't want to do it 500 at a time. I mean, that's going to take, it's going to take a long time to make that happen. And it's going to be messy and expensive. So you know what we should do? Make them kill each other. 
boom, problem solved. And they are, they are throwing scraps on the ground and forcing them to fight each other over that. And Jakar sees that. And it, and this is a thing too, in a political and societal climate that we live in today, where we look at people in the quote unquote ivory towers out there, how can they make decisions on our lives? You know, they, yeah. he's a CEO. What, what do they know about real life? And blah, blah, blah. Well, Jakar's view sitting in comfortable Babylon five and sanctuary and eating meals and having his corner desk allows him to see that bigger picture and allows him to see that they're making them fight over nothing, over nothing. And he's able, because he's Jakar, he's able to verbalize that. He's able to use that to bring them together and have them stop fighting it. But if he was in it, if he was Nafar on Homeworld doing this, yeah. he couldn't have that vision. He couldn't see that. Now, I'm not saying that people in every towers are good or that we should listen to and trust every C-suite person that exists out there. That's not what I'm saying, but I think we have to give credit to you know perspective and point of view. M means it means a lot. It means everything. I did like on a fun, on a fun note, I liked it when Talon and Sheridan were having their orange juice. That was pretty fun. And then Sheridan was like, yeah, man, I don't know. I don't know what people would think, you know, about an earth captain walking around with a Narn bodyguard. And he says, they would look at you and they'd say, here is a man who will live to be 150 years old. Right. I thought that was great. That was awesome. And then the last note I have on the Jakar and the Narn stuff outside of my final thoughts, but when Garibaldi dropped into Jakar's quarters and tried to talk him out of going, that was awesome. And what I love, not only was it cool of Garibaldi, but it was just this cool theme when it was done. Like when, and when Garibaldi kind of said his piece and headed out, Jakar says, thank you, Mr. Garibaldi. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like, Hey, so Londo sucks. I'll, I, I'll call you Mr. Garibaldi now. Like I'm cool. <laughs> I like that scene a lot. Well, Jeff, we've certainly been broaching. I think we've already crossed over into it, into that spot of the show where it's time to really boil it down and see, I think we've already done it, but let's just name it for what it is. What parts of the show have that Star Trek quality to it? What are the deep moral messages? What are the mirrors to society? Where is the hope? Jeff, is there any hope for a better future in this episode? Uh, you are going to rate this scale on a, uh, uh, this episode on a scale of zero to five deltas as to how Star Trek this episode is. I'm going to take the other side. I'm going to take the easy side this time. I'm going to do the Star Furies on this one. Jeff, what you got? There is so much. There is so much. And we've talked about a lot of it. Do I just need to single you out and just drop out of this conversation no. for a while? Let you go. I don't think so. <laughs> and, 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 Cause I, what I'm going to do is I, I, there's a couple things I want to like call out specifically, but there's an over, there was an overarching theme to this episode that I w really want to dive into for this one. Cause we've talked about a lot of the other stuff, but one thing I've noticed over the last couple episodes is there's a phrase that has been dropped a couple of times and that's, uh, it's nothing personal. And I think that when okay. we look at things like war or different isms out there or genocide, it's never personal, right? It's, that's kind of what helps the perpetrators sleep at night. And we've been hearing more and more of that. And I think part of what brings that is this overarching theme in the episode. It's pride, right? There's the pride of the Narns that Londo wants to crush. There's the pride in Londo to not have veer around to question him anymore. There's the pride that Jakar has in his people. There's the pride that the whole crew of Babylon five has thinking that they can respond to this probe and answer all of its questions. And then the pride of Dr. Franklin thinking that he can do it all. Pride, ter pride turns out really only like turns out positively only one time here. And that's with Jakar. And that's because his pride is in something other than himself. He's selfless, not selfish. And that's servant leadership, right? That's what it's all about. And servant leadership is one of the core messages of Star Trek. 
Jakar's pride as compared to say Franklin's pride that shows up with him using stems or Londo's that shows up with him bad mouthing Narns and sending Veer off. Jakar's pride shows up as humility. If he has to die to save others, okay, let's do it. But then that same pride gets reflected in the people that he is willing to die for. This is the power of that servant, that the being proud to serve people comes from. We mentioned the line a minute ago, what's more important than safety for the Narns? Freedom. But I also think loyalty comes into that. Nafar is trying, believes that he's trying to do the right thing. And he's showing loyalty to the Centauri to try to do the right thing. Jakar believes he's doing the right thing. And he shows unquestionable loyalty to the Narns to the point of willingly walking onto a ship to, to his horrible death that's waiting for him. But because of that, because of his humility, they, those Narns are loyal to him. Now where they turned on Nafar. And I really like the way they showed it, you know, because this is something as a leader you like to hear. They all lined up, you know, bit by bit. And they, they said the word, the, the line here was so great. You are valued and you are needed here. Yeah. That's the hope Brent that it takes one person with humble pride in what's going on to give us hope to, to fight the fight that needs to happen. We talked about all the other stuff throughout the episode. This Brent is a five Delta episode. I wholeheartedly agree. And Jeff, as you were saying that, and you were talking, I was just kind of looking back through my notes over the last couple of episodes so far. And we're only three episodes in mm -hmm. season three has been a heavily, heavily, uh, I'm not gonna say star Trek season. It's a heavy Delta season so far. Yes. Over yeah. three episodes. Like, so, and I kind of hope it keeps going. I know. I love you it. Know? I and love it. This, this might be like where we sit back and, and start going, okay, this is what I, I again, this is what sci-fi really as a genre, I think serves. It, it just lends itself to this kind of stuff, which is why we're doing this whole show. It, exactly. Um, but I'm with you five deltas uh, through and through that. Those words they use though, you are, what, what, what is it exactly? You are something and needed here. Now you are, you are valued. You are yeah. valued and needed here. Direct words of affirmation are so important to be able to look at someone and go, you are smart. And I'm not talking about in a pack led way. I'm talking, to, <laughs> you know, you are smart. Oh. No, we're past that part though. Our, oh yeah. We're in the third. deltas. Yeah, but it's okay. But, but that's still my third. So I'm good. Okay. Um, but to, to, to look at somebody, you are, you are creative. You are good at this to, to, to verbally say you are this thing, you are valued and we need you because so often you remember that, what was it like episode three or four last season? Sheridan's like, oh, I don't really know if I want to do this anymore. Yeah. I don't and, and to have somebody sit back and go, Hey, Sheridan. You're good. And we need you here. We need you here. Like those kinds of words go a really far, far way in talking. You know, um, I think about it mostly in terms of being a parent these days, you know, Hey kid, you're good at this and we need you. The family needs you or, or like my, my son right now, he's gearing up for uh, spring football. Like they're, they're in their, their training, uh, uh, summer or spring training, time right now you know and and a, a phrase that we use a lot is junior team need you you've got it you've got to go out there and get ready so you can be ready but your team needs you you know mm -hmm. um so I, I i'm very much with you but i'm not supposed to be talking about that i'm supposed to be talking about star furies yeah, let's talk get, about star the, furies yeah um you know star furies I, is after all this time we've been doing star furies for a season and change now jeff uh, it's still, it's still this weird mix of how Babylon five is it? And just how much do we enjoy the episode? If I look at it on just pure enjoyment, like this is maybe like a two and a half, three, like it, this wasn't like a stellar standout. I'm going to remember this episode for, for a long time. Every episode, every, 
every episode is somebody's favorite episode. So somebody's like, oh, I love A Day in the Strife. That's just amazing. Um, it, it wasn't that standout to me. But you talk about all those messages you just talked about. And not delivering it so much in a Star Trek way as much as a Babylon 5 way. Right? Which is all, Which often is a showing us how we get there, not necessarily being on already there. Right. Um, or doing it in a way that you just don't expect and subverting expectations. And to see Jakar be like, yeah, I'm leaving. And all of these people kind of stand up and be like, I am Spartacus, <laughs> you know, yeah. you are valued. And I, I just don't feel like we would see that very much on, on Trek, not in that way. You know, maybe Worf would go off and sacrifice himself, but then people are like, they wouldn't try to convince him to stay. Like they would like go rescue him or something. Well, they let know? him, they let him go when he yeah. did that. Right. And then, yeah. and then tried to back him up afterwards when he got called on it. or when, mm-hmm. when Neelix left to go and, you know, help a colony and, and possibly die himself in doing it. Yep. They let him go and they celebrated yeah. him leaving to do the thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I absolutely could see this as a star Trek episode though, with the B plot and that whole probe thing, like, totally. you know, that's what the bridge crew is taking care of while we work with like one of these other two or three of these other people down here. So, um, I don't know that it really, in many ways, it felt very star Trek in many ways it didn't. So I'm going to kind of split this one right down the middle. I'm just gonna give it a three star fury deal. I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, it handled a lot of things, but I also it, just, I don't know. Like I said, kind of felt there in the middle to me. So it seems about right. I can't disagree with that. But just like last season, Brent, we are currently creating the 100% completely accurate definitive ranking of the third season of Babylon five. Our current rankings have convictions in second place and matters of honor in the top spot. So Brent, where do you put a day in the strife? I'm looking back through my notes and convictions was the episode where they were poking people. Yes. And we got Londo and elevator at Londo and Jakar in an elevator. We did. Don't say which was, again. I'm not going to, but that was such a fun scene. That, that was so, that was such a good, a good bit. Matters of honor was, uh, we got introduced to Marcus and we had the dude, um, from earth force coming around. Yeah. I, I liked that episode better. I think that was a stronger episode than this one, just as an episode. Um, so I'm going to leave that one in the top spot, but the question is, do I put this above convictions then, or do I leave it below convictions? And as much as I liked Londo and Jakar in an elevator, I think this one probably it, this one had a more complete piece to it. The whole piece with Jakar um, was was incredibly moving, I thought, and I th- I think this was a stronger episode. Uh, probably not by much, but I'm gonna put this at number two. Wow. Well, as much as you I, seem sur- you seem surprised by that, Jeff, a little bit, a little bit. I just think, yeah. I think because as we talked about, this one was fine. It was fine, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think that, but as I think about it, you know, I mean, convictions really had like a, a handful of standout scenes, you know, and they were mm-hmm. Londo related, right? The Londo and Lanier stuff in the, in med lab. And then the Londo and Jakar stuff in the elevator. But, um, I mean, it, I did, it, I did really like in convictions, uh, cause I, I brought this out last week and I'm now that we're talking about this, I remember this of, I liked the looking at Londo and how he responds based on how two people respond to him and setting those two pieces next to each other. Uh, I did think that was really cool. Ooh, is it too late to change? Well, th- th- let me tell you this though. It's not, yeah. it's not, you still can. But I mean, the other yeah. thing was the, we'll say the main story of convictions it just held no water, right? It was dude yeah. who got picked on in high school. So he decided to bomb the station. That was bad. That really was bad. Yeah, no, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave this right where it is. Yeah. I don't disagree. Right I don't disagree. If I wanted to, it wouldn't matter. I don't get, you get, you get to rank it, right? That's how it works. And Brent, that's it for a day in the strife. Next week is our 50th episode. 
Is it really? It is. We're at 50. And this is 110. We're almost, we, we really don't need to celebrate 50. We need to celebrate 55. Right. Well, and to be that's fair, our halfway point, right? Well, it'll be 50. Well, I just know 50, maybe like 59. Cause we do our wrap ups. So I'm counting our wrap ups in number 50. Right. So, oh, okay. Okay. This would be our 48th episode coming up. All right. We're getting we're there for that, but we're still it's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. But, but as a podcast hitting 50 episodes, that's a, that's a marquee. You know, uh, you, you hit that. What What's it? It's seven. Most right. podcasts don't make it past seven. So once you hit seven, that's a big deal. Uh, and then really 50 is really the next one. You, you yeah, don't 50. Do 10, you do yeah. It's really 10, 50. And then you hit the hundred and you kind of go from there. Yeah. It's the so, hundreds yeah. from there. So, yeah. So it's kind of a cool thing. And for the 50th episode, we will be watching passing through Gethsemane for the Ooh. first time. Now, this is one of the games we like to play. Brent talked about it earlier in the episode, but we've never seen these episodes before. We haven't looked ahead. We haven't read anything about them. We don't know anything more than the title of the episode. And we like to guess what we think it's going to be about. So Brent, what do you think passing through Gethsemane is going to be about? Yeah, Jeff, I feel like I get one of these every handful of weeks uh, that are, it's a strong biblical reference. Which They're like, hey, what degrees do Brent have? And let's uh, let's pick one of those. Let's yeah, yeah. Uh, this harkens back to a voice in the wilderness to me a lot. Uh, but passing through Gethsemane, Gethsemane was uh, uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying before uh, his crucifixion. And um, he he gets captured by the by the Roman uh, authorities. Um there so this would presumably then be about somebody passing through their darkest hour right um maybe even right before making a big sacrifice maybe even deciding if they want to make the sacrifice or not because that was that was the whole thing where jesus was like hey if you can let me not do this that'd be really cool but if i got too cool anyway um so somebody trying to decide if they want to be a sacrifice we saw that with jakar in this episode right um so I don't think it's Jakar because Jafar, Jakar, Jafar, Jakar has already J- proven who? that he is. That's it. Three. <laughs> One of those things. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. He's a Jafar right Jafar! Uh, he is willing to be the sacrifice. So he, he's already made that determination. So uh, I don't think it's Londo because Londo is not willing to be a sacrifice. I think we've established that. So Delenn, maybe? Sheridan? Sorry, I've got to talk this out. I'm a verbal processor. Uh, that's what I'm going with. Uh, it's Sheridan or maybe Delenn. Um, or maybe them both together. Sheridan and Delenn. Oh, that's what I'm going with. Sheridan and Delenn uh, facing this future they have together. Because, you know, they have that, like, connection thing. And I think we're going to learn maybe more about what that is. And they're going to look at it and kind of go, uh do they have to become sacrifices themselves for the greater good? Or like, do they have to sacrifice their job, their position, their something in order for something else to happen? Uh, Jeff, I think, Oh, did we, we predicted, I know I've had this thought in my head. Have we talked about it? I'm just going to sit here and vaguely reference something and then not tell you what it is. (laughs) No. Um, didn't, didn't we discuss maybe in a season wrap up, like a prediction for season three, that like Babylon five was going to like succeed from earth force. Yes. We did talk about that. Maybe that's what this is, is oh, wow. them looming on that decision of like, okay, do we have to take Babylon five away from earth and like become our own, our own thing? Because y- we haven't talked about it yet, Jeff, the intro to the, to the show, not our mm-hmm. show, but to the show itself. And I noted something this week because uh, it's Ivanova doing the voiceover. Um, she says, "She says it became in the year of the Shadow War, it became something much more." And I think that there's there's a lot like that's supposed to tell you kind of what happens in the season, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a piece of watching how Babylon Five becomes the last best hope for victory. Like not just, oh, one day it is the last best hope for victory, but this is how it it becomes that. And this I think might start us so Delenn and Sheridan facing their future together, knowing what's to come, having to make this big decision that might be Babylon five. Wow. I don't know how does Babylon five break away from Earth Force. I don't know how that works. Could they just be like, 
we're our own thing now. <laughs> Change to take the logo off your uniform. There does, you go. Does does Sheridan get oh, oh Jeff, is that is that oh oh because we talked about like the the uniform change in the the thingy the the uh action figure guy is does this, he have the earth force the... gimmick on there does he have it no but he has the status bar oh we're figuring it out oh Maybe we're figuring it out it. Oh. oh wow but it does it does it does actually say up here earth force uniform oh john okay, okay so nick's oh. that idea maybe but not so much he's still pointing hardcore <laughs> Brent, this, is think, a, yeah, this is a this is a hard one. This is a hard one, Brent, to figure out because <laughs> Gethsemane means one thing, right? You know, I mean, like in 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 the Bible, if you really dive into especially the Synoptic Gospels, when he got arrested, you know, the night of the Last Supper wasn't the only time they were in Gethsemane. It was a normal place, you know. Yeah. I mean, Judas took off after the supper and he went to get the the Romans and then walked up to G he knew he was going to be there. Cause that's what they did. They hung out, they drank some wine, went to the Stayed garden all night. Yeah, yeah. Went to the garden and, and hung out, you know? So, it, it, I don't, but, but in the vernacular, right? Like Gethsemane means the agony of the, you know, sweating blood, begging yeah, for yeah. the cup to be passed, all that kind of stuff. And right. so at first I was thinking the same thing. I'm I, like, the note I even took was this has got to be the beginning of Sheridan's trial. This is where, he really starts getting put to the test and has to decide, you know, am I going to be the one or not or whatever. But then as you were talking, I started thinking about the title and I, and you know, JMS gets cutesy with the title sometimes a day in the strife, right? You know, and now for a word passing through Gethsemane. So imagine mm -hmm. that the agony in the garden is happening right over there. Right. And Jesus is alone. The, the apostles are asleep and he's upset with them because they should have stayed up and uh, awake with him and praying, but, but they didn't. And you're just walking through and there's a dude over there sweating blood and crying to his dad who you can't even see. And a bunch of dudes passed out drunk around him and you're just passing through. Maybe it's not our main players who are going through something. Maybe we are observers in, in somebody else falling apart. Ooh. So I am going, and, and, and it's hard to say, right? Cause it could be the Narn. We already watched the Mark cab fall apart. Is somebody else going to fall apart? Maybe right. this is a new player of some kind. I don't know what I'm going to guess though. I, cause I got to guess something, right? It's going to be our earth force crew on Babylon five experiencing and observing somebody else in their biggest trial. Oh, is it a kosh? It's a night watch thing. Oh, so they're going to watch Zach. Zach's in the main credits now. Uh, Kaniki, right? Kaniki. Yeah. Kaniki yeah, yeah. is going to be put to the test and they're going to be oh. observing it. That's going to be the thing that, that's going on. And this is where it's, it feels early and it's, it's probably not the right time. I'm probably super wrong, but I think that we're going to see Kaniki face his trial and have to determine if he's going to go full night watch or not. But we'll find out right here next week. Hey, thank you everybody so much for joining us for our discussion today. This means the world to us. Please don't forget to subscribe. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to us on whatever podcatcher you're on, give us the subscribe right there and then you'll get notified of all of our great episodes. And if you haven't already, stop by Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Audible, Podchase, or any of those cool places. Leave us a rating and a review. I will read it right now here on the podcast so until next time hey jeff yeah yeah brent uh so you know i've been thinking lately um i spoke with the ambassador and we've come up with the new plan that uh for you is a good opportunity i don't think i want a new opportunity brent i like this one this is a good opportunity too bad it's happening anyway go pack your bags all right, well, peace, victory, and long life to you. It's my first time.
You know what I just thought on the Gethsemane thing? Oh, what's that? Oh, Club 65. You guys get an exclusive. What's that? It's free. This is uh, not going to the podcast. Go it's ahead. not going to go. What about the Catholic dudes that are? Oh, on the brother, uh, right brother Theo. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a. Uh, oh, oh, that's pretty early. Well, yeah, good. This could be like maybe they're going to celebrate Lent on uh, on Babylon Five. We'd be we'd be close to Lent. On oh, what if it? Oh, so what if it is brother Theo himself, right? And he's got a. I mean. Look, we've already what I forget what the actor's name is, but we've already seen this actor play one character who had to drink from the cup, so to speak. Right. And yeah. literally, literally go like this. He is the cup now. <laughs> <laughs> Does he get to meet Draw? Does old Draw get to meet new Draw? Oh, how cool would that That'd be? be, fun. <laughs> be I just and I need him I need him to acknowledge it somehow. Like just give like a wink or be like, Right, how you doing? Huh. That looks really uncomfortable up there. I'll bet that's terrible. <laughs> Boy, I couldn't do that for very long if they paid me. <laughs> I went that oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Club 65, you're the best. Drop a 65 oh, down really below. Are. And yep. uh, let us know you're here. Drop in the 65. Be cool. And the, oh, yeah. There's the thing. Bit.ly slash B5 Club 65. Get your Club 65 gear. Yeah. Brett and I were talking about this the other day. We we ordered some Club Sixty Five gear because we're we're part part we're here we're, we're part of Club Sixty Five, <laughs> and uh, so we tell you right that this is sold at cost, and you might be a little sticker shocked when you see some of the stuff. We were a little bit sticker shocked. Um, we're getting zero, just so you know that through the distributor. This this isn't a profit place for us. This is mm -hmm. us just trying to get you something cool the best yeah. way we can. So just think of it as a shipping cost and, um, mm -hmm. and that it's cool. That, that way, honestly, we don't have to keep a bunch of back stock that we paid a crap ton of money out for, and then have to turn around and ship that and pay more money for that. Like, you don't want that. We'll, we'll, we don't want, yeah, you don't want that. Yeah. So That'd be yeah. a real headache. Yeah. That it actually, if we did that, it actually might be. more. I would, because I, I tell yeah. you that, uh, yeah. if we, if we had inventory, and I was having to go to the post office and stuff. Yeah. It's going to be more. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a little profit off of that. So yeah. A little margin. Well, we're not gas money, but we're not exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's all there. It's good stuff. Yeah. Not every, it's not all like super expensive. It just, you know, it's not five bucks either. Right. Yeah. Which is what yeah. I think in our heads when Which, we set this up, we thought it was going to be. But. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's what it's about like twenty bucks or so. Yeah, yeah, right. It's about twenty bucks. I bought I bought a coffee mug, and that was like uh, by the time shipping and everything got added, it was like fifteen bucks. Yeah, now fifteen bucks for a coffee mug seems like a lot. Yeah, but you know, but it's, it's a club it's sixty-five. The, exactly, exactly. I've I've got some gear like that that I have from some old podcasts of mine, and it's it's fun to see them like in the, like my wife grabs it and takes it to work with her. Yeah. Takes her coffee. And I'm like, oh, that's old. But I'm, fun. I'm wearing one of my podcast ones right there. There you go. So, you there know, you go. yeah, there you go. Good it's stuff. all good stuff. Um, all right, Jeff, let's get out of here, man. We've talked a lot of Babylon five today. We have, we have, uh, it's club six, five. You guys are awesome. You rock. Thanks for being a part of this and, uh, catch you guys next week when we, Talk about what is probably just going to be a really feel good episode, Jeff. I bet. I bet it's going to be great. You know, yeah. I mean, there, there's a yeah. reason in Catholicism, there's a reason when they talk about Gethsemane and the rosary, we call them the sorrowful mysteries because they're real feel good ones. That's a new one to me. All right. Oh, really? yeah, cool. You guys rock. We're on that happy note. Yeah, right. Uh, hey, Kentucky Derby is coming up this week. If you're watching this as we release uh, Kentucky Derby and go, that's way more fun. So. <laughs> Although it might lead to some sorrowful mysteries too. <laughs> Bye guys. You guys See are awesome.